This is the Grow My Clinic podcast by Clinic Mastery, where we help you deliver amazing client experiences to grow your clinic. Welcome to another episode of the Grow My Clinic podcast. My name is Ben Lynch, and today we have a very special guest, Dr. Glenn Richards. Now, Glenn is a veterinary surgeon and founder and former CEO of Green Cross, Australia's largest pet care company. Glenn spent 10 years building a multi-million dollar integrated pet care empire, which now operates in more than 130 veterinary hospitals in Australia, New Zealand, and China. Green Cross is also Australasia's leading specialty pet care retailer with more than 200 stores operating under the brand names Pet Barn and City Farmers. You may better know Glenn from his involvement with My Foot Doctor and his media presence as one of the four investors on Shark Tank Australia, hosted on Channel 10. Glenn, welcome to you. G'day, Ben. Thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I'm looking forward to the chat. Awesome. Glenn, I'm interested in breaking down your transition from clinician to business owner to investor. So a lot of people listening in, they're a clinician. They're a practitioner that's gone, I want to start a business. I want to start my own private practice. And all of a sudden they go from the artist, that person that does the health stuff really well, to becoming a business owner, which has a whole host of other skills that are required. I'm interested if you could share your story about how you transitioned from that clinician to business owner and some of the key lessons that came out of that transition. Absolutely. So it's good you sort of paint that picture because I am a bit of a fan of uh, Robert Kiyosaki and the the cash flow quadrant where you go from employee to uh, self-employed to business owner to investor. And I guess all of us, as we age, we we simply move around that that cash flow quadrant and um, um, in different businesses on the business owner in a lot of my businesses now I'm an investor that uh, absolutely started as the employee. And uh, to give you the background, I was working as a vet in, in London doing the obligatory uh, couple of years overseas and um, decided it was time to come back to Australia. And I rang up a, a little bit practice in uh, Townsville and said, look, I'm interested in buying your, your branch practice. And they said, look, we're actually going to sell our... Uh, our main hospital and the branch practice. And I said, well, who knows? And they said, no one. I said, well, tell me a little bit about the practice. And over the course of about a, a 10 minute discussion from, from halfway around the world, I end up uh, finding out how much they wanted the practice, what it turned over, sort of the, what the clients were like, what the sort of patient base was about in, in the veterinary industry, and uh, made a an offer. And uh, pretty much in 10 minutes, we did a hand bill for me to buy their, their main hospital and their branch practice. Um, I then uh, needed the funds because I was a, a young a young guy based in London and doing a lot of backpacking and, and still based in a practice there. I wrote, so I rang my father, the, the bank of dad, and said, look, um, just done this handshake deal for a practice in Townsville. Dad, how do you feel about uh, lending me some money and perhaps guaranteeing my bank loans? And uh, uh, he had pretty much uh, hung up straight away, but he ran <laughs> back and explained what I was up to. And uh, he said, look, uh, I'm interested. Uh, why don't you develop a business plan? And when you get back to Australia, um, run me through what you, you're planning. Um, so about a week later, I actually got on the Trans-Siberian Express. And, and I've told the story many, many times. Uh, but, but basically got on a, on a train. I'd done a lot of business reading for a couple of years while I was doing, doing my vet work in London. So I'd almost pretty much read every book that was part of the MBA program. So I had some good business background. And uh, so sat down over a course of seven days to write a business plan to buy a vet practice in Townsville. Now, the, the, the bonus to this trip was that was the, the carriage I was on was full of Ukrainian traders that uh, sort of strongly suggested that we had to uh, uh, have a few vodkas with them every night and a few vodkas every night would uh, sort of expanded and, and as the journey went on my, my sort of business plan to buy one vet practice in Townsville expanded into a business plan to, to create a network of uh, veterinary practices across Australia um, but a key part of that, that business plan was dealing with some of the big industry roadblocks in the veterinary industry that there was poor succession planning for 
role of vets. Um, a lot of the younger vets were disillusioned by what they found once they got into practice. Um, there wasn't good basic support for the people that worked in our industry. There was a high suicide rate. I think the quality of practice was, was uh, marginal because a lot of practice owners stop investing in equipment and facilities and growing their team as they evolve their practice. Um, so a big part of the business plan is trying to deal with industry roadblocks and, and think of, uh, about how to better, I guess, support veterinary hospitals and how better to support people that work in our industry to create a, a better work environment, to create a better place for the clients to bring their pets um, so they would get a, a higher standard of, of veterinary care. I guess a better succession plan for the older vets so that there was a, a definitely a, a better way of, of exiting their practice or, or uh, some, some cash out of their business. So there's a whole lot of whole lot of things that were circulating that I dealt with in my business plan. So I ended up getting back to Townsville, convinced Dad to, to buy my first vet practice, um, grew that to, to five veterinary practices in Townsville. I then linked up with a couple of mates in Brisbane and a, and a mate in Melbourne, and we formed a co-op, and uh, that co-op then did some marketing, did bookkeeping, did some benchmarking, um, KPI, scorecard keeping, that, that sort of stuff. So it sort of evolved. And uh, then we had a couple of guys turn up and they were wearing white shoes from the Gold Coast and, and uh, uh, they had optioned up 13, 13 vet practice in a, in a classic roll-up model. And uh, so we had our, our 17 practices in, a, uh, in our co-op. So we're still all independent owners, but we were, we were basically sharing a whole lot of knowledge. Mm-hmm. So, so that, over the course of about a year, we, we end up slamming it all together into one larger corporate entity. So the optioned up practices, our co-op practices, and we put them all into one big, big group in one day. And uh, on that day, we listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. We raised $10 million from the Australian public, and we listed a, a minnow microcap with a $20 million uh, valuation with... Uh, I think it was about 32 practices by the time we got to the, the start line. And uh, I guess my co-founders, um, someone had to be the managing director, and uh, my co-founders all stepped backwards and left me standing there. And uh, so I had to pack my family up in Townsville and uh, pretty much overnight went from um, being a clinician, doing a bit of time on the business and, and doing a bit of work in the business to suddenly being the CEO of... Um, of 300 odd employees, 32 clinics, and uh, having a national footprint. And uh, so the first year or two was just an absolute hellfire in terms of um, mm-hmm. developing skills to be a CEO. I, you know, I've run five practices, I've been part of a collaborative group, but it was a very, very big learning curve to, to step up to be a public company CEO. Yeah, absolutely. How, how did you manage to keep the wheels on during that time? Obviously, it, it evolved like a, an avalanche by the sounds of things. Like, what were some of the key things that kept it together? Because there's probably plenty of people who've navigated a similar transition and things have fallen off. So what was it that kept it all together, in your opinion? Look, I think at the end of the day, I, I had a, because I'd been a frontline clinician, I had a deep and humble respect for, for all our people working in our frontline clinics. So the first thing I did was simply engage with them, deeply engage with them, and, and because we only had 32 clinics, um, I could get out to, to our clinics on a very regular basis and started asking them what did they need to do a better job of running the practices they were working in. So we could then prioritise some resources to those things we needed, a, a common IT platform, a I guess developing a, a benchmarking and coaching model so that we had KPIs on every individual clinic and benchmark each other and then having and developing coaches that could go in then and, and sort of work on the things that weren't working well in individual practices. So some of those things, you know, it, it, it was a matter of, of, of uh, getting the culture right very early, but at the end of the day, respecting frontline clinicians, that they do a damn hard job and our job is to support them. I think we started with that position that we were a support team, not a headquarters. And as a support team, deeply engaging with vets and nurses to say, what can I do for you to make your workplaces better? And then they gave me the clear indications on the on the areas that we had to allocate time and resources to. But I can tell you that the first year was just damn hard. Um, mm-hmm. By the end of the second year, I was exhausted and mm-hmm. um, um, realised then that I had to start 
bringing in more sophisticated managers and, and support people to help me in, in the journey. And uh, uh, I had a young CFO at the time that gave me very strong advice that we needed you know, to improve the team that was the corporate team that was supporting our frontline clinics and uh, uh, and about the same time uh, my, my chairman of the company Andrew Gibbs said look you've got to come along and meet this guy Vern Harder she runs a a, a, um, a workshop called uh, the, the the Rockefeller Habits and I went yeah yeah sure so we turned up to the workshop and I was a bit cynical but came away from that one day workshop with a a copy of uh, the Rockefeller Habits and, and uh, bought the DVD set and got stuck into, I guess, developing my skills. But the, the, the epiphany I had was going, you know what? I don't have to know too much. I just have to find a great team and, and then hold them accountable and responsible. And, and as the CEO then become, I guess, the, the guy that, that uh, brings it all together, gets rid of the politics and the egos and just work out what we have to do and where we have to agree on where resources are going to be allocated. Mm. Um, so it was a bit of an epiphany for me, because as a vet, and I guess as a podiatrist, you, you feel you have to know everything. When your patient comes in, you have to help them and solve their problems. And as a CEO, I, I was in that position, and then this epiphany over, and I went, I, I don't have to know everything. I have to find people that, that can answer and, and help with, and come up with solutions and get them to work as a really collaborative team and then at the same time deeply engage with our, our clinicians and our support staff and, and make sure we were talking to them on a regular basis. And I think you'll find um, a lot of that philosophy has flowed into the development of my foot doctor and and, uh, yeah. and, and all sports, our physio group um, that, we're, that we're working on at the moment. But at the end of the day, the job of corporate in, a, in a na developing a national network is to work out how to best support those local businesses that, that are involved with, with that corporate group. Yes. A couple of things that really stand out for me there, Glenn. Obviously, the humility of going, you know, I've got to find a different perspective. You you took on Vern's stuff, and it's incredible. If people haven't read it, get onto it, digest it. So you, yep. you, you got around some better people who are more skilled in business or had a different perspective in business to upskill from that clinician to business owner. And then one thing as well that uh, I love there, and I've picked up on a number of your uh, presentations, etc., is your attention to people, and maybe it's your own language of the, the progression of your people, is something that uh, you've often mentioned. Can you just tell us a little bit more about how you might do that? You said engaging with our frontline clinicians is important when we're navigating yeah. that change and growth. As as a as a smaller, if you go back to that smaller time where you were working ridiculous hours as a clinician, making the transition, because a lot of people here will be saying, "Ah, oh, you know, if only I had the time to work with my people." <laughs> um, yeah. What do you say so, to you that? Know, when, ben, when you're a small team, you, you're interacting on a day to day basis, just to be part of your team. Mm -hmm. But at some stage, so you're picking up the, the gossip, the hallway conversations. You're picking that up. As the organisation gets bigger, you lose some of that. So you've got to work out communication strategies to ensure everyone in the organisation gets a chance to put their concerns forward, their their their, their uh, ideas forward, and how to capture that. Um, and and in smaller practices, you know, you day to day with them, but at the same time, you still got to have that discipline, having some formal time, which is the old e myth, Michael Gerber, work on the business time and having your team as part of working on the business so that they actually have a formal setting to be able to participate and not just have a hallway conversation. And, and I guess the bigger the organisation, the more formal and disciplined those structures have got to be. So we, we got very good at it. The bigger we got, you know, I used to do it quite well in, in uh, when I was just based in Townsville and, and uh, before I discovered the, the, the Bernard Harnish material around the Rockefeller habits. But... Um, we then got really serious about uh, the 90 day resets, the you know, monthly ma management meetings, the weekly operational review meetings, the daily huddles, those sort of communication channels. And then pull that right across. So our area managers, we, we engage with practice managers. 
our um, operations manager would, would engage with the area managers. As CEO, I would engage with all my senior managers on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and we'd bring all our area managers and all our senior managers and all our middle managers, marketing and you know, all those different functions, all together on a monthly basis and have a full day of, of um, I guess, educating, uh, of spelling out what our initiatives and projects we're working on and how we need to get the buy-in of our, of our team. Um, and we also have the other way, what's happening out in our clinics that we need to hear about. So by the time we, we go to reset the company, which is every 90 days, we're hearing the critical issues coming out of our team members and the critical issues coming out of our customers. And one of the little things I got by senior managers to do was to start ringing one employee and one customer once a week. So there's nine of us in the senior management team. So that was uh, 18 phone calls by the senior management team to pick up one key conversation with a customer, one key conversation with an employee, what's, what do we need to keep doing, stop doing or start doing, those, mm. those classic versions that, that <laughs> keep doing, stop doing, start doing and bring that into a conversation and go, okay, we're doing that well, we're doing that badly, let's put that into the opening of our, of our 90 day reset. So we'd always have a 90 day reset with, okay, what are the critical issues in the company? What are our employees telling us? What are our customers telling us and what are our shareholders wanting from us and all those things went into the mix and then we go through a process in the in the reset around developing the priorities and, and those those things that we had to work on that would take time and money to to make sure we we're continue to develop the company because it gets so easy mm. you know you turn up every day and nothing's too bad so you don't keep working on your business but if you take a mindset that you're never perfect, that you can always fine tune. You know, it's the Japanese looking for one percent of improvement on a daily basis, and lo and behold, things start getting better as time goes on. Yeah, absolutely. I want to dive in just a little snippet there about when you move to a model like this, where you're having more meetings, they're more structured, and perhaps there's some, um, you know, KPIs that we're starting to look at. Did you find and maybe how did you navigate any resistance from clinicians who are traditionally more about, you know, uh, in your case, the health of maybe the animals and so forth, uh, the, the investment of the pet care owners, navigating between the money mindset of practitioners and the yep. business objectives how did you go and do you have any kind and now you're obviously in um, physio and podiatry no doubt this comes up a lot of the time with people is as we move and focus on business growth these become important discussions how do you how do you approach that resistance from a practitioner you know it's back to being being authentic and as a professional person you're authentic about wanting to do the best by the patient and by the client if you're in the veterinary industry. So we're our patients or our pets, clients with the, with the pet owners. So for this terminology, so the authenticity around um, high quality or best quality medicine or best quality care. And I often say to my team way before doing the public company was you, you've got to see the person coming in and see the pet first and not go looking for their wallet. You simply do your examination, decide what needs to be done, and offer what's needed. Yep. And you let the patient or let the client decide where they want to go with that. But as a clinician, you offer the best care option first. And if you're really authentic about that, you go home every night and you sleep well. Because if you start seeing your client as someone you're just going to try and get as much money out of, you, you won't last as a professional person, as a clinician. And so I used to have the, the mother-in-law test just pretend that person in front of you is your mother or your mother-in-law and you simply want to do the best by them or the best by, by their pet and you offer what's needed. It's as mm. simple as that. And then what we find is quality of care generally leads to a very profitable business because you're doing really good quality stuff that's probably more challenging, more exciting, and by the way, because it is more challenging and more exciting, it probably is a high margin job. So if you're a podiatrist, do you want to be doing biomechanics and, and you know setting people up to walk effectively or do you want to quit tunnels? 
It's as simple as that. And and, uh, and in, in our betting industry, it was you know you do thorough and proper examinations, uh, advise your 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 patient or your client of what you're finding, and um, quite simply, you offer the solutions. So with our benchmarking and coaching, we strongly led with quality of care or best care standard KPIs and dovetail those into some financial KPIs. But we had a strong view that, that we had to make our, our teams business aware. So if we're doing really good quality medicine and quality clinical work, this leads to actually quite a good business model. But if you want to do high volume, low margin, uh, you're going to burn out and you're not going to be a very profitable business, which means if we're not a very profitable business, um, there's no money for reinvestment in new equipment, there's no money for reinvestment in new facilities, it's pretty hard to give pay rises because we're, we're, we're not a profitable business, it's pretty hard to expand the team, it's pretty hard to find the money for education, you know, all those things. So, so we had a, an active program that, that rolled through our clinics on a regular basis around business awareness, advising them how the business actually made money, um, the importance of best care standards and, and all those things sort of gel together. And, and, and then our KPIs, and we had 10 key performance indicators with about another 40 that also sort of came in under those around quality of care KPIs as well as then, as I said, that linked also to financial KPIs. But there was a deep view that we had to help educate our, our clinicians and make them aware of what best standards of care were, and then, by the way, um, we have to measure stuff. Because if we're measuring stuff, it tells us where we need to educate you or support you better. Yeah, absolutely. I love that distinction because as a business owner, you start to dive into the numbers and the details, and it's your livelihood, so you're really invested in knowing what's going on to grow this business but a lot of the team members may not have a clue about how the business works or operates. So you're really making that education something that's important ongoing for your team. Absolutely. We, we had a strong open book approach. So we were going to show our numbers to the Australian public as a public listed company on the total company. Then we decided <clears throat> we would show each individual practice their p &L. So each practice as well as getting their financial information, more importantly, if they got all their, their standards of care. This is, this is how effective you are as a clinician. And by the way, this is how effective you are as a business. Mm -hmm. And that, that was part of their business aware education. And uh, I was very comfortable that each, each right down to, from, from senior vets right down to trainee nurses, they got to see how that business was performing. Mm, absolutely. Some real pearls here, Glenn. Uh, so for mine, you know, the 90-day resets, having those 12-month plans, so important to come back and the communication with your, your frontline cl clinicians, the meeting between any sort of senior management, the communication seems to have a lot of structure and a lot of planning and a lot of key objectives, you know, each 90 days that you're working towards. Uh, is that a fair summary of some of the key elements in business that you work I, 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 Absolutely. I think the reality is no matter how big or small your business, there is always improvement and you should always have those projects and, and someone in your team in charge of that project to drive improvement in your practice, no matter how small or big it is or how big or small the, the company is. There are always things you're doing to stay relevant to the marketplace, to stay relevant to the customer, and to stay relevant to the employee. So, you know, you're always, and, and for us, it was a 90 day reset. Um, but we did things like, okay, every single practice has to have a business plan. So every year we have a, a, a day out for each practice and we develop a business plan for that individual practice relevant to the community they serve. If there was a lot of change going on, then they might do a 30, uh, a 90-day reset as an individual practice, or generally the things weren't changing that rapidly, so that, that reset was really on an annual basis for an individual practice, and as a company, and for doing projects to support them, to be a 90-day reset. So those of you who are listening, you know, if things are pretty steady and static, it's a once-a-year uh, business planning strategic session, coming up with a plan and, and all the actions that you're going to do to improve your practice on, a, on an annual basis, but if things are changing fast in your environment, and, and uh, you've got to do it more regularly. So if we're 
sitting here as as tech company, I would argue a tech company should be doing a 30-day reset because they're growing so fast, things are changing quickly, whether they're they're, uh, changing their their IT platform or they're getting traction with the marketplace and the number of customers coming at them, whatever it is, they're probably more likely to do a 30-day reset. A good, steady business maybe every 12 months, but a fast-growing health company, we were doing it every 90 days. Yeah, terrific. Absolutely terrific. So then if we could boil it down, Glenn, if if you couldn't pass on your wealth to your kids, you you could only pass on some key principles about business. What would they be? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I have no doubt that all of us have that capability to step up when you need to step up. So you, you're able to expand your your um, your thinking by reading books, um, by finding mentors, by chatting with peers. So to some degree, um, go find a good story and work out and learn from that story, be it through a book that you're reading, through a mentor you're chatting with, through reading white papers online, through whatever. Use that as, as some sort of um, basis to continue to grow your, your personal growth. But I guess I, I, one of the key things I found was was the marketplace, the business marketplace is competitive. Therefore, you've got to be prepared to work harder, longer, and smarter than the competitors out there. And when you're in business, you are competing against the businesses down the road, and you have to be prepared to um, to educate yourself through, as I said, mentors and, and book reading and going to workshops and re- listening to podcasts like this. Um, finding a mentor that's perhaps been on the journey uh, prior to you that's going to pass on some good knowledge. Um, you're going to work damn hard. Those, but when you're an early early stage business or when you're a young business, you are going to do some serious time in the business as well as having time to work on the business. And then as I said, longer, smarter and harder. You've just got to be smarter than the opposition and you've got to pull as much information, much education, much mentoring as you can to, to, to play in the, the great game of business. But, um, uh, you know, I think we see inspiration and everything. And I, I think finding uh, things like podcasts and, and uh, books to read and, and what I know is a lot of successful people are happy to, to sit down and have a coffee with, with you. And yeah. an hour with someone just might give you that one extra little idea that makes you understand the opportunity you have to go after or an idea that's going to take you a little bit further. So it's being willing to get out of your comfort zone and not just think life's going to come to you. You've got to come out and look for it. And and uh, I, I ended up on Shark Tank simply because I, I, I about 15 of us went for a, a screen test. Um, I didn't want to do it. Steve Baxter, the, one of the other sharks, was come on, John McGrath, pulled out. Oh, we need a new shark. We've got two weeks to fill that spot. Go, go and do a screen test. So I did, you know, about 15 of us went, and, and uh, apparently. And uh, I got the call, and I'm, God, I'm not keen to get, I'm not keen to do this. I've got a national TV. I'm going to look like a dickhead for sure. <laughs> so I sat, sat out on a Sunday night with the family. I said, look, I've had this offer to be on this show called Shark Tank um, and explain what Shark Tank was about. And uh, and they said, why wouldn't you do it, Dad? I go, what do you mean? They said, well, you always tell us to step up and have a go, whether there's a, an athletics or the cross country at school or school plays on or whatever. You always say, look, step up. What's the worst that's going to happen? You, you know, it feels a bit uncomfortable. Just get on and have a go. So they, they used it on me and I went, actually, you know, you're right. I, I didn't and I don't want to be doing this thing. It's uncomfortable, but I might as well have a crack at it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, that's, the, and, and, that's, and that's what I want to impart to my kids, that, that people, some people step up, some people stay still, and a lot of people step backwards. Mm. And I want my kids to be sort of people that step up and have a go when, when something's coming past their front door they at least say they had a go. They might have failed in, in that pursuit, at least they had a go because it's worse when you don't even have a crack. Yeah, absolutely. Here, here. Well, that's a good sign also of some successful parenting that it's coming back at you from the kids. <laughs> well, I'm, still, I'm still feeling the pain. We're up to season four. It's on TV now. I can still feel the pain. I can still look at myself. 
I think you look like a dickhead on national TV. <laughs> anyway, we're, uh, we're getting some good. Yeah, absolutely. It's a terrific show. Uh, everyone should absolutely watch it. If nothing else, it's you know a sense of accountability to reflect on your own business and go, oh, do I know that about my own business? Yeah. Um, or have I thought of it yeah. like one of the sharks said? So absolutely. Like you said, if I find, Glenn, a lot of health professionals are really good. I mean, it's we have to keep up with the research and the evidence. Uh, so they're really quite good at consuming yeah. a lot of knowledge and respecting that business has a different set of skill sets. And like you said, getting mentors or podcasts or books to develop those other skill sets is is super important as well. Wow, there's some really practical gold uh, there, Glenn. I have to say thank you so much. What would be your parting advice for listeners today You've been through it. You've you've been that clinician. You've made the transition to a business owner working ridiculous hours, managing a family. You've got four four daughters. Is that correct? Like, you uh, know three, what it... Three. three daughters. Three daughters. And uh, you know what it's like to navigate business with a family, etc. What's your parting advice for the clinic owners on the other end of the line here today? Look, I think you've got to uh, have a vision for what your business and your life looks like. What is your absolute optimal? Because a lot of people don't need to do what I've done. You know, I, I wouldn't recommend it to, to 95% of clinicians I, I bump into. They are great clinicians and they should continue to be great clinicians. But they have to be willing to collaborate. Uh, you know, creating a bigger team and then perhaps putting a business manager on, on the payroll or a practice manager at the very least in the business to do a lot of this crisis management, to do um, external facing stuff around the business, maybe all they need so they can then have more time to be being a great clinician. But I, you know, I think strong view is, is um, as, as professional people, we need to continue to develop our, our professional capability, but we should be business aware at the very least and be aware of where we, we have our weakness, be it, putting forecast models together or a budget together for next year, perhaps um, go and get a good accountant and perhaps bring in a good practice manager to complement or supplement the skills that, that you don't want to develop. Mm. You know, it's okay as long as you're business aware and you pull up at least monthly to say, how is the business going? How is the morale of the practice? Are my people happy? Are my customers happy? And are the financials happy? And you've got to keep looking at those those three key things. And in my world, it was shareholders, but in your, you know, our, most of our clinicians, is, is there a reasonable bottom line for the amount of work I do, the amount of risks I take in running and owning this business? Am I getting a reasonable return? And work, you know, you've got to spend a little bit of time working on the business. So um, I'm, I'm not going to give too much advice. I've had a big hard journey with with my own uh, businesses, but the reality is be willing to collaborate, be willing to delegate and be willing to assess yourself about where your strengths and weaknesses are. And if you love being a clinician, stay there and bring in uh, someone else, employ someone to cover off your weaknesses around the business side. Terrific. Terrific advice. Glenn, how can listeners follow up with you, connect with you more? What's the best way if they want to learn more or listen more to what you have to say Apart from watching Shark Tank, well, how can they get in touch and, and watch you grow? Okay, I have a confession to make, Ben. So for three years, I've purposely done zero social media. If you get on, you'll be embarrassed by how few people that, that, that follow me on Twitter. Or, and I don't have any public-facing Facebook or Instagram. I do have a LinkedIn account, um, and people can message me through LinkedIn. Uh, but my... I guess a lot of my companies now are wanting me to lift my profile so that I can help support them a bit better with my social media and some of my education tips. Um, so watch this space. I will be going a little wider um, and perhaps launching some Facebook and Instagram activity that, that helps impart some of my experiences. And, and more importantly, I, I actually work with some wonderful entrepreneurs and uh, I've got about seven what I call scale-up CEOs that I work with. They're larger companies that are going to end up listing on the stock exchange or, or being sold into larger businesses. And I've got a, another G12, what I call startups and early stage businesses that are really passionate entrepreneurs. And I learn stuff every day. So I'm going to probably start at least putting out a, a little bit of a, a blog or, or a little bit of a 
bit more social media presence in the next month. So watch this space. Anyone interested, you'll track me down through LinkedIn. Oh, terrific. We definitely will all be watching this space. Uh, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Ben. really enjoyed the chat and uh, I look forward to, uh, to keeping in touch with you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of the Grow My Clinic podcast. We'd really appreciate your honest reviews and ratings on iTunes and to share the love with a friend or a colleague. We'll have all the show notes over on the website at clinicmastery.com. Have a terrific day, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Grow My Clinic podcast. This is the Grow My Clinic podcast by Clinic Mastery, where we help you deliver amazing client experiences to grow your clinic. 